We continue our series on the book of James this morning, and we'll be looking at James chapter 1, James chapter 1 and verse 21, James chapter 1 and verse 21, and our focus this morning is detoxing the mind, detoxing the mind. Every mind of every Christian, well, every mind of every person in general needs a good detox every now and then. Uh, and I want to begin by talking, before we talk about detoxing, so to speak, I want to begin by talking about garages. All right, you know, now how many of you uh, have a garage for your car or have had a garage for your car in the past? Okay, all right, I see about a, a fourth of you raising your hand. Okay, how many of you have seen a garage, all right, and know <laughs> what a garage is? Okay, all right. Some of you are still not raising your hand. But I want to know, I want you to know, I love you all. You are a great congregation, but you stink at this hand-raising thing, okay? <laughs> I, I have often done, you know, get, raise people, get people to raise their hands, to get engaged, and some of you won't raise your hand on anything, you know, so you just like determined, you know. Uh, but I'm going to assume that everyone here, even though you didn't raise your hand, you know what a garage looks like and know what a garage is. And the purpose of a garage uh, is to store a car. Now, when my wife and I were in Ohio, uh, we were blessed to be there for three years, and I pastored a church, Ligo Baptist, as you know. And while we were there, uh, we lived in a humble, modest, uh, three-bedroom rambler house that was on the church property. It was a parsonage, and, uh, and it was a great, great to live on there. And I, I can now tell people that don't know any better, I, I'm giving you the punchline, but I can tell people that I had to walk to work, and, uh, and then I even had to walk uphill, and, and, and I did, and, and I had to walk in rain, sleet, snow, whatever, I had to walk to work, so it's, it's a lot more impressive when I haven't given you the punchline already, but one of the benefits of the house that we lived in, it had a two-car garage. Now, my wife saw the two-car garage, and her immediate thought was, cool, storage, and and so now in the two-car garage, she, she, she just said, well, we're not going to take up the whole garage. We'll just take up one of the bays so we can at least put one of our cars in the garage. Uh, now, we have a two-car family, so we have two people, two drivers, and so two cars. I'll let you guess as to who got to put their car in the garage and who did not, you know. Um, not that hard to figure out. So, um, so Jane got to put her car in the garage, and, and I got to scrape the ice off my car and that sort of thing during the winter. Uh, but... But the bottom line is, when you put a lot of junk in the garage, there's no room for the car in the garage. And the same is true in our minds. If you fill your mind up with a lot of junk, there's not a lot of room for the Holy Spirit to work. Now, one of the things that Brother Tom Rogerson said last week is that you got to give God room to work in your life. Now, some of you may have, may have been taken back by that statement because you're thinking, well, God can do anything. But the way, and it's true, God's all-powerful, and he can do anything except lie, he can't sin, you know, he can't make a square circle, do something that's illogical, because God's a God of order, but everything that's possible to do, that's within his nature, God can do. But the way God has set up the universe, and the way God has set up with each and us, each and every one of us, is that he works with people who open up their hearts to him. And if you have closed your heart to God, or hardened your heart to God, then you're not giving God any room to work in your life. And so today we're going to look at what James has to say about uh, making sure that our minds are open to the work of the Lord, because it's only if we do that that it's possible for us to do all the other advice that James is giving us in the book of James. And so James 1 and verse 21, our, our main text today, is therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, there's a lot of um, uh, phrases and words in here that we're going to kind of break down and explain what, what each of them means. We'll get back to filthiness and wickedness. Those are pretty self-explanatory, but we're going to dive into those a little bit and look at what that means. But uh, first, he says, receive with meekness. To be a person who's meek, that means a person that does not have a chip on their shoulder, a person who's not cocky, who's not stubborn. In the old classic King James Version, it talks about people being stiff-necked. So in this context here, when it talks about people being meek, that means you're open to hearing God's word. You're open to the Lord. Uh, you're meek. You're, you're of a gentle spirit. Now, meek does not mean weak, and that's some people uh, mistake the two. Uh, Jesus was meek, and yet no one would accuse Jesus of being weak. Uh, but Jesus was always open to hearing from his father. Jesus understood the importance of, of communication with his father. And so because of that, we need to understand we've got to keep ourselves open. We've got to keep our hearts open and be constantly receiving with meekness the word that the Lord gives us. And when it talks about 
the implanted word. Let's explain what, what that's referring to. Uh, and you hold your place in James. You'll need to turn to these passages, but I'm, I'll have them projected for you. Here, these are some other passages that talk about the word that's in our hearts here. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, Paul writes, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. The word of God in this context is talking about the gospel, the message, the, the word from the Lord, the prophetic word from God that talks about our being saved and what it, what's required for salvation. And those who receive that, well, who welcome that, who receive that gladly, they're the ones who are saved, okay? They receive it, they've accepted it, and that word then becomes implanted in them. And that's what Paul is talking about. But note Paul says, uh, it also effectively works in you who believe. Salvation is not the end point for the Christian. Salvation is the starting point for the Christian. When you accept Jesus Christ, your Savior, the word takes up root in your life. It becomes implanted in your life. The Holy Spirit is in your heart. And the idea is that then it begins to do a new work in you. The word begins to work in you. And as you surrender more and more to that, you become more and more filled by the Holy Spirit. That's the idea, and that's what Paul is getting at. John picks up the same theme in 1 John 2 and verse 14. Uh, the second, second part of that verse, John writes, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. These are people who are strong in their faith. The word of God is abiding in them. Remember, Jesus talks about abiding in the vine. There's all kinds of references about this. So these are people who are strong in their faith. The word of God is abiding in them, and because of that, they're able to overcome the enemy and overcome the devil, and that ought to be the goal that, that we all ought to uh, strive for. Uh, I'm, now, if, I hope none of you would raise your hand. How many of you aspire to be a weak Christian, you know, an ineffective Christian who the devil constantly beats up on? Anyone like that? Okay, so hopefully none of us here uh, is, is trying to be that kind of a Christian. We want to be a strong Christian, someone that abides in the Word of God, someone that's abiding in the light, someone that feels the work of God in us, but we have to do our part. We have to do our part in that. Uh, many people want the Lord to provide all of our needs, and God is a great provider and provides our needs, but we have to do our part in that. When the, when the Lord gave manna to the children of Israel, the children of Israel had to still go out, pick up the manna, and eat it. They had to do their part. Now, by, God has provided all kinds of things for us today. He's provided his word, his, his salvation message. We have to receive that. He gives us the Holy Spirit, but we have to then grow spiritually and what we need to do. He's given us the Word of God here. We have to still read it. You've got to pick it up and read it. And having the Bible on your bookshelf at home is great, but you need to take it off that bookshelf and actually read it in order to understand and get the benefits from it. You know, you don't become a strong in the Lord simply by osmosis. You know, you've got to actually take an active part in this. Now, Paul in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, um, uh, actually, I... Uh, I lied on this. It's 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 22, but, um, but I'm going to read these three verses to you here. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Because of this, Paul writes, flee also youthful lusts. Now, some of you might be thinking, I got that covered, I'm no longer young. So, you know, but the fact of the matter is, youthful lusts, youthful lusts can stalk us until we're 80, 90, 100 years old, okay? All right, uh, youthful lusts are always there with us. Uh, the, I was just reminded of a story of this uh, a young man, he was about uh, in his 20s, and he was being mentored by a gentleman who was older. He was in, the gentleman was 80 years old. And the young man was saying, I'm really struggling with lust, you know, and I'm really hoping that there's an age at some point that I can get to, but I will no longer struggle with that temptation any longer. Do you have any advice for me? And the guy says, I don't know if there is such an age, but it's not 80, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so the bottom line is uh, lust and tempta temptations will always be there. 
Um, the issue is, what are you going to do with those temptations? Are you going to flirt with those temptations and surround yourself with those temptations? Or are you going to do, as Paul says, flee them? Flee them. Remember, the Bible says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Flee also youthful lust, but here's what we do instead, because you, you can't just suppress sin. You've got to replace it with something. You've got you to put something else in there. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. It sounds like the fruit of the Spirit. With those, look, look at this, who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. God is looking for people who are calling on him in prayer out of a pure heart. And I want to ask you honestly this morning, and I want you to answer this honestly in the privacy of your own heart and mind right now, but answer it with the Holy Spirit as your witness. Are you here today in this church with a pure heart? Is your heart and your life and your mind pure and open to the work of the Lord? Or is there some junk in your life and heart that's getting in the way of that? You know, when you, if you've ever played with the old uh, AM, FM radios, the old dials, you know, where you had to, you know, actually turn the dial, you know, we've we, we become very technological and lazy in this day and age, you know, people don't even know what that is, they just push buttons now, but but I remember in TV, let's go with TV. I remember a TV with the rabbit ears. Remember the rabbit ears? Okay, this is going way back, you know. But uh, I remember where my parents would, would ask me to change the channel for them. I was their remote control, you know, uh, because there was no, so I have to walk across the shag carpet and go and, and get the, uh, uh, growing up in the 70s, we didn't have shag carpet, but you know, saw a lot of people. But anyway, I would go across the carpet and, uh, and the, the, we definitely had 70s decor in our, in our house, but um, don't miss that. But anyway, um, and I would turn the channels and stuff. Now, we would be able to get four, five, seven, and nine pretty well, but 20, eh, iffy, uh, 22, 26, those channels, forget it. Uh, and, and, but occasionally, we would, we would even struggle getting some of the basic channels. And so I'd have to stand there and try to, you know, move the thing. And if you stood there next to the TV, sometimes the reception was perfect. But if you went back to your chair... <laughs> Uh, you would lose that reception. So, you know, you have to kind of stand there and you kind of contort yourself and kind of like hold this. And so, you know, you want to make sure you see that. And by the way, watching the football games back in those days, they didn't keep the score flashed on the corner of the screen. That was like a newer thing. So for many years, you had to make sure you timed it just right and have watch and make sure the score was flashed up because if you missed it, you might be watching the game for another 15, 20 minutes before they finally tell you what the score is. But anyway, the problems of uh, many years ago. But anyway... Um, the point is that, that the reception uh, for radio, for television, used to be a time where the reception wasn't always good, sometimes still the case today. Um, and that's the case when you pray. If you're praying to God from an impure heart as a Christian, that reception is going to be very difficult. And quite often we have struggle hearing from God and, and, and communicating with God and knowing what God's will in our life is because we're so busy focused on our will for our life and putting all this other junk in our lives that we're not really open to what God has to say to us. And if you really want God to be speaking to you, if you really want to enjoy that communication, that interactive communication with God, you've got to be open to the Lord working with you. You've got to clean the junk out of your life. Now, I didn't, I didn't put this in one of the slides, so I'm going to ask you to turn to this passage. And when you think about what, you know, filthiness and overflow of wickedness could James be talking about here, and I believe you can get a good idea if you look in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to start in verse 17 here we're gonna i could go i could literally read the whole chapter here because it's a great great chapter but paul starts out this chapter talking about how we need to walk worthy of the calling that's in us we need to we need to walk worthy of being christians we think about think about what that means when you call yourself a christian you are calling yourself a follower of jesus christ and you think about, we're not just part of any religion, we're part of the true religion, we're part of the religion of Jesus Christ, and so, uh, and, and James uses that word religion intentionally here in James 1, so that's why I'm using it now. We have a religion based on a relationship with the Savior of this world, and we need to be walking worthy of the name Christ, walking worthy of the name Jesus, and that's what, that's what Paul really calls us to in Ephesians 4 here. And so look in verse 17, Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 17. I'm going to walk through this passage with you. And really, Paul enumerates a lot of the filthiness and wickedness 
that we as Christians have allowed ourselves to be overcome by. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. He's describing the unsaved here. This is the unsaved. Do you know, can you think of a culture today that that could very well be described by these words? Uh, And this is the unsaved culture that we live in today. And it's the unsaved culture that Paul and the apostles lived in back in the first century too. These are people who are, who are, Paul's talking about the rest of the Gentiles who don't believe. Remember, this is a letter to the church in Ephesus. These are Gentile Christians here that Paul is writing to. Keep that in mind. So Paul is writing to Gentiles in the church of Ephesus who have accepted Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. And Paul is saying, you are now a new creation. Don't go back to your old ways. Don't walk as those other Gentiles do, as they walk in ignorance and ungodliness. Don't go there. Instead, you need to do better. And in verse 20, he says, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've made a decision, a specific individual intentional decision to give your life to Jesus, you are a new man or new woman. You are a new creature at that point. You have a new identity at that point in the Lord. And you are not to walk as you once did because you have now in a new life. New life, okay? That's what the Lord has given you. So here's what Paul says. Let's get specific about this. Therefore, putting away lying. Okay? There's one field in this. A Christian should be honest. A Christian should walk with integrity. A Christian should tell the truth. A Christian should not be a deceiver. You need to put away lying. And I would, as we go through and name these sins, I want you to be open to the Holy Spirit right now. And the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind, if you're open, what sins you're still struggling with. And be open to that as we go through this. Consider this like a report card, okay? If you will, as you go through this. Put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Now, anger is an emotion. Anger in and of itself is not a sin. Someone cuts you off in traffic, you're probably going to get angry at that. What do you do with that anger? Do you want to ram them off the road, you know, at that point? Do you want to show a gesture to them? Uh, And what what do you want to do at that point? Uh, When someone in your life offends you or hurts you, you might be angry. What are you going to do with that anger? Do you walk in rage? Do you walk in bitterness? Do you let anger consume you and become who you are? I know a lot of angry people right now. And it's like they live for their anger. Anger is, defines who they are. And that's what anger can do. It can consume you, take you over, and change you. In fact, the the way to avoid that, Paul says, continuing this verse, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You might be angry with someone, but if you're angry with them and holding on to that anger for a long period of time, then you have let the sun go down on your wrath, and you are allowing junk into your heart. You might be saying, well, Pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand what that person did to me. Join the human race. People are going to hurt you. People are going to disappoint you. No one, unless, our, we, our, our, the couple that we're hosting this weekend has a one-year-old boy. Sawyer has probably not been hurt enough to hold any bitterness or grudges right now, okay? All right? But give him time, okay? All right? Uh, and, and every single person, if you've been alive any length of time, you've been hurt enough and wounded enough that you could justify potentially holding on to anger and bitterness against someone else. But when you hold on to anger and bitterness against someone else, it doesn't do really them much harm. It does all the harm to you. 
because it changes who you are. You can't do that. You can't let the sun go down your wrath. You've got to get rid of that because Paul says, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. You might say, well, I don't steal. Well, think about on a practical level. Do you cheat on your taxes? That's stealing from the government. You may, you may not like the government collecting taxes. You know? And you may be a libertarian that believes the government should take 25 cent taxes and that's it a whole year. I don't know what your political views are. That doesn't matter. If you're living in the United States of America, you've got to abide by the laws of the United States of America. As long as those laws don't directly contradict God, you abide by those laws. And you need to be honest in your taxes. Uh, you need to be, are, are you cheating your employer of time? Are you stealing time from your employer when you're at, when you're at the job? And you've got a job to do. You've got to work to the best of your ability. The Bible talks about how we need to serve our masters, we would say in our, in our modern age, our employers, in a way that brings glory to God. So would your employer look at your conduct at work and say, yeah, that's a Christian? You know, I mean, are you being honest with your time at work? There's all different kinds of subtle ways that people can steal today. There's piracy and all kinds of things where you can you know, get software and music and games that you didn't pay for. There's all kinds of ways that people can steal today. And we sometimes think, well, that doesn't really count. But the bottom line is, um, you know, are you a person who purchases what you are going to take? Or are you a person that just tries to get away with taking as much as you can without paying for it like you should? And so don't be a thief. Don't be a person who steals. Um, steal no longer, Paul says, but rather, Paul says, let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. In other words, it, you know, when we labor, we want to we be blessed so that we can bless others and help others and stuff. And this is also gets into laziness. Paul talks about, in a different passage, those who don't work, don't eat. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy and don't make excuses for not working. We, we've got to work. You've got to be diligent uh, be a hard worker and be an honest worker. Paul then says, verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. How are you doing on that? When you get angry with someone, do you minister grace? When you're bitter with someone, do you, do you speak grace into their life? When you speak to someone, do you speak to them in a way to help them or to hurt them? You can try to lift people up with your words or you can try to beat them down with your words. I was in Chick-fil-A the other day uh, and uh, there was a couple that was sitting next to me and I almost thought I was going to have to kick into pastor mode and do some marriage counseling with this couple uh, and, uh, because they, they were going down a not good road here. But at one point, the wife said to the husband, that basically he made a mistake and was justifying, trying to justify himself and their, their little girl was there with them. And the wife said to the husband, why are you doing that? Why don't you just tell her the truth that you screwed up like you always do? Now, I don't know the whole story there. I don't know how many mistakes or sins that husband has committed. I don't know. But I do know this. What that wife said is not Ephesians 4.29. I have seen in public, I have seen parents say awful things to their kids. Beat their kids down. You're no good. Now, you all know I'm not a huge fan of the Dallas Cowboys, okay? But as I have shared before, and I will never be a huge fan of the Dallas Cowboys, but <laughs> as, I, as, I, as I shared before, um, one of my heroes, though, one of, the, one of the athletes I look up to is Roger Stallback. Great Christian man, fine Christian man. He played for the wrong team, but that's okay, you know. Uh, and uh, but Roger Stallback was invited to uh, uh, give a, a, a was invited by Chuck Colson's old organization, Prison Fellowship. Um, Prison Fellowship is still around. Chuck Colson's gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, but Roger Stallback was out at a, at a Prison Fellowship event at a prison, and um, one, and he had finished sharing his testimony with the prisoners, and he sat down, and another speaker got up, and the speaker was preaching, and. He asked for a show of hands, how many of you in the, on the crowd right now, this was a men's prison, how many of you had fathers uh, who said that one day you'd end up in prison? 90% of the hands went up. Roger Stallback leaned over to the guy next to him and said, that's funny, my dad told me that I'd be a star quarterback when I grew up. Parents, you have tremendous influence on your children. 
You might be thinking, no, I don't, you know, uh, all TV and all that. Listen, there have been studies after studies after studies done that parents have more influence over their kids than any other human being. That's how God set it up. And I understand the devil's not cooperating with that, and the devil's doing all kinds of things in our culture today to minimize the influence that parents have on our kids. That's absolutely true. But ultimately, parents have the major influence on their children. So what are you doing with that influence? Are you beating your kids down? Are you nurturing them and building them up so that they live their lives in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Now, you might say, well, pastor, you don't understand how mad my kids make me. I'm a parent. I get it. You know, and my kids are, are, are human like the next kids, you know, and, you know, Jane and I do the best we can with them. But that doesn't mean our kids are always floating around singing hymns and quoting scripture, you know. <laughs> all right. So, you know, our, our, our kids are kids, okay. And, uh, and so I understand that sometimes they can make you angry. But, you know, what are the words coming out of your mouth? And, and with your husband and with your wife, with your children, with your coworker, with each other, are you speaking corruption or are you speaking words of life? Now, sometimes you are commanded to speak the truth. And I do not believe that we should just shy away from speaking the truth because we don't want to offend people or hurt people's feelings. You've got to speak the truth. But Proverbs 3 says to balance truth with mercy. And Ephesians 4 is very clear here that our goal is to restore people to faith, is to build them up, to get them back on track. It is not to beat them down. And you should never use your words to put someone else down to build yourself up. It is not your place to put someone else down in order to build yourself up. It is God's place to build you up. That's why the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So be humble and be positive and be pure in your words that come out of your mouth. The Bible says that we do this um, so that we can impart what is necessary for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And look at verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is another reference to the implanted word here. We are, we are sealed. The Holy Spirit is sealed in us. So this is not where you lose your salvation kind of thing. Let me, make a, let me, let me pause for a second. And if you look back in James 1.21, um, many people misunderstand this because it says, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And so people take that and they think, Oh, well, that means I've got to keep receiving it because it's able to save me, but if I don't receive it adequately, it's not going to save me, so I could lose my salvation. Well, if you interpret it that way, one, it's you're interpreting it in a way that contradicts the rest of Scripture, for number one. But number two, if you interpret it that way, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for huge problems. Think about the stress that you'd have to go through where you are constantly afraid of losing your salvation. You know, every time you make a mistake, every time you sin, every time you snap at your spouse, every time you do something wrong, every time you watch a television program you shouldn't, go on an internet site you shouldn't, or do whatever that you shouldn't do, you've lost your salvation. You know, and you, you know, if, if you're like the average person, you'd be getting saved over and over and over again. You'd be afraid, you'd be constantly, you know, uh, uh, mortified that God has forgotten me or isn't loving me anymore or whatnot. That is not what we are called to. The Bible says we're not given a spirit of fear. And here in Ephesians, Paul makes clear that we're sealed into the day of redemption. This is what Jesus is talking about, how we're in the Father's hand. No man can pluck them out of the Father's hand. So the salvation is secured. You're sealed, okay? But look what you can do. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Back to Ephesians 4. You're sealed until the day of redemption, but do not grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, you can, you can grieve God. When, when I've told you this before, but when I was growing up as a teenager, one of the main reasons, especially when I was an older teenager, one of the main reasons I obeyed and respected my parents, in fact, the main reason, was not because I was afraid of punishment. That was when I was a little kid. But when I was older, the reason that I obeyed and honored and respected my parents is because I loved them and didn't want to hurt them. And when your motivation is that toward God, it brings your, your spiritual relationship to a whole new level, where it's not like I'm afraid God's going to zap me. You know, and certainly God is capable of zapping people, okay? And certainly, you know, it, we need to understand that God is still a God of judgment. But don't live and be like you're just trying to please God so God doesn't judge you. You should be pleasing God because you love him. And you're grateful for what he did for you. He sent Jesus to the cross to die for you. And you should be eternally grateful for that. And because of your gratitude and your respect and your reverence for God, 
You don't want any other idol in your life. You don't want anything else in your life. You want to please him. You want to honor him because of who he is and your relationship with him. That should be the motive there. And so um, now when it says, what does it mean then, which is able to save your souls? This is simply a reference to the fact that you have the truth. In other words, what, what James is saying is it's the gospel that is able to save people. It is the gospel that has the saving power in it not any other counterfeit religion. See, one of the ways that the people back then were corrupting themselves is they would, they would go slide back into their ways of idolatry and sometimes. And it's like they're going back into false religions. When we have the truth, we've got the, we've got the truth. We've got what it takes to save us. Why would we go for something that's counterfeit to that? Why would we go back to our old ways and serve something else? You know, there's no other God, no other idol that can save you. It's only Jesus that can save you. He's got the power. No one else does. And so James is reminding us, why in the world are you trying to bring substitutes into your life? What, do, you know, what is it that you want? What is it that you need that the Lord can't provide you? That's what he's saying. And so this is, uh, it, it's kind of like if you're a wide receiver in the NFL and you go out for a pass, and the quarterback sees you, but he sees that you're carrying a bunch of groceries, you know, in your hand, okay, as you're running across the field. Um, and, and at that point, it's like, um, you're here to catch this football, you know, and to advance the football. And it's not for this other stuff that you're here. And a lot of times, we fill our lives up with stuff that really is not why we're here. It's not what we're about, and it takes us away from our purpose. And so that's what he means. We need to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Let me finish Ephesians 4 and wrap this up here. But do not grieve the Holy Spirit, uh, for is what you were sealed to the day of redemption, and let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. That's a lot of lists right there, a lot of things right there. But are you bitter toward anyone or anything? You know, there never should be such a thing, I'm going to say it, as a bitter Christian. No bitterness, no wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. And we're in a good place, very good place right now as a church. But there are many churches right now that you walk in those doors and those churches are characterized by wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. Verse 32, and be kind one to another. Be kind. This is, this is a natural outgrowth of true love, by the way. Be kind one to love is patient, love is kind. Be kind one to another, tender hearted. We have a tendency when we get hurt to harden our heart. And that's not what we should do. We should keep a tender heart, keep ourselves open. You say, well, you don't, you don't get it, Pastor. If I keep my heart tender, I'm going to keep getting hurt. Well, talk to God about that. How many times has God been hurt? How many times have we hurt God? <laughs> keep your heart tender, you can toughen your skin but keep your heart tender. Keep your heart tender, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. My, my former pastor, when he was here several years ago and preached, he talked about an illustration of a famous evangelist. I think it was, was D.L. Moody, I can't remember, but a famous evangelist that was in a revival service, and he did an altar call, and people came forward, and this one lady came forward, and he led this lady through the Lord's Prayer. And he got to the part about, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against others, and the lady wouldn't say a word. And uh, the evangelist said, I'm sorry, ma'am, there's a lot of noise going around here, but I didn't hear you, so let me repeat that again. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Silence. And finally she said, I'll never forgive her for what she did to me. And then he said, well, ma'am, you might as well go back to your seat right now because there's no way God's going to work in your heart right now. Are you holding on to bitterness toward a person and you refuse to forgive them? Now, forgiveness does not mean that you've got to continually subject yourself to getting beat up by the person. I do believe in setting boundaries. David, if you recall, when Saul tried to kill David, David fled from the presence of Saul. So David protected himself, and I am all for protecting yourself and setting up boundaries. That's a good thing. And, you know, I would never say, for example, to a wife who's being physically abused by her husband, well, just forgive him and continue to get abused. I would never say that, okay? 
you know, you get out and you get help, okay, in that situation, and he needs to be held accountable for that. There, you know, uh, physical abuse is unacceptable, okay, uh, totally unacceptable to God. But that doesn't mean you can, you can remove yourself from a situation that's causing you harm and set boundaries and protect yourself, but yet at the same time, you can still forgive the person who did that harm to you. You don't need to carry that bitterness through the rest of your life. You can forgive them. Um, there was a lady that sadly and tragically was sexually molested, and uh, she was um, a Christian lady, and yet she continued to live a life of great happiness and joy. You know, she went through the counseling and everything, but many years later, she was happy, joyful, serving God, and someone walked up to her and said, how in the world can you be so happy with what happened to you? And she said, that man took X number of minutes from my life. I'm not going to give him any more. You've got to clean the junk out of your life and let God work. Open your heart to the Lord. It is the truth of God that will set you free. Not holding on to bitterness. Forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. So getting back to our passage here. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I want to close uh, with uh, one of my favorite psalms. I have a lot of favorite psalms, uh, as I'm sure you do too. But one of my favorite ones is the one at the very beginning of the book of Psalms. Um, and as the praise band comes forward, I want to read the first part of that psalm to you. Because some of you are probably thinking, well, that all sounds great, Pastor. Get the bitterness out. Get the, you know, be sure I forgive. Get all this out. But how do I do that? You know, it's easy to say that. It's easy to nod and say amen, absolutely. But then life happens and things are real. And how do you do that? And already, Paul's answered that question. And James has answered that question already. But here we see it again in the psalmist here. When David writes this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So look at this verse very clearly. Who are you hanging out with? I want you to think about this. Who do you spend the most of your time with? Who has the most influence on your life? Who are you spending time with? Are this, is it the godly or the ungodly? You know, we say, well, I hang out with Christians. <laughs> Sometimes Christians can be ungodly. Just because you're hanging out with someone who's a Christian does not necessarily mean that you're not sitting in the seat of the scornful. I want you to think about the quality of the talk and conversations that are around your life. When you go out to lunch with people, when you have you know, overnight getaway trips with people, when you do things with people, whatever the case may be, what's the quality of that talk? Is it, is it pleasing talk to the Lord? Or is it scornful talk? Is it bitter talk? Is it angry talk? You know, I, I, you know think about your associations, your friends, all of that. Are you hanging out with godly people who lift you up and hold you accountable and bring you to the Lord? Or are you hanging out with people that are pulling you away from God? Think about that. That's what Psalmist is talking about here. And then it talks about what we should put our minds on, what we should think about day and night, what we should be constantly thinking about. Now, many people today, they don't, even med they don't meditate on God's word. They think about everything but God's word. And that includes Christians. Are you meditating on ESPN? Are you meditating on American Idol? Are you meditating on, uh, on, on Breaking Bad and Netflix? Are you meditating on whatever else? Are you meditating on these shows? And don't, you know, you laugh, but what is meditation? Meditation is, is, is watching something, enjoying it constantly, thinking about it over and over and over in your mind, turning it over. I mean, some people will watch the same shows or movies 600, 700 times, you know? I can be guilty too. I've seen Star Wars more than a couple times, okay? I understand, all right? But the bottom line is, when you look at back at your week and your month, the quantity of time, what is it that you're feasting your time on? Think about it. What are you, what are you meditating on, thinking about what consumes your mind? And if you know the cast of your favorite television show or the roster of your favorite football team better than you know the precepts of the Lord, then I would submit to you that you're not feasting your mind day and night on the law of the Lord, like the psalmist says here. And so the solution 
to making sure that you detox your mind is to flood your mind with positive stuff, to meditate on the positive and godly things, to hang out with the right people who are going to hold you accountable, to be in this book regularly, day and night, to be in prayer regularly, you know, to be a godly person, and, to, and that is the key of it all. But if you refuse to do that, and you instead go on autopilot, then you will find that the devil will put junk in your mind, and your garage will be full, and you won't be able to park your spiritual car in there, so to speak. You'll have no place to get refreshed or refueled because you will constantly be bombarded by the enemy and what the enemy wants you to think about and worry about and consume you, and it will compromise your spiritual walk. And so my, my exhortation to you this morning is simple. Feed your mind on godly things. Give God a place to work in your life. Clean out the junk and let the Holy Spirit fill you so you can truly be the Spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ that he wants you to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done. We thank you so much for your precious word. We thank you for the implanted word. For those of us here that have truly received and accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we thank you for the implanted word, Lord. That implanted word that is able to save us. It is the only word of any religious faith in the world today that is able to save. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, for the fact that we don't need idols in our life because we've got you. Father, I pray that right now, today, if anyone here is dealing with something, some junk in their life or heart that they need to get rid of, Lord, Lord, I pray they'll have the courage to come forward and lay that at the altar and just give it to you. But whether they do that coming forward courageously or whether they do that quietly where they're standing in their own, in their own heart and mind in prayer, I'll leave that between them and the Holy Spirit. But Father, I just pray that you will move in our hearts right now during this time of invitation and reflection. May we detox our minds and open ourselves up to the working of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. If you